For the latest about China's space mission in Beijing, we have Yang Yuguang, professor at the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, and in Washington, D.C., Dr. Amitabha Ghosh, chair of the Science Operations Working Group for the NASA Mars Exploration Rover mission. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. China's second spacewalk completed. Amazing. A lot of people here in China are extremely excited. Professor Yang, tell me about the real mission behind the glamorous walk. Well, you may notice Mr. Liu Boming uh, first go out of the hatch. He said, wow, it's so beautiful. Uh, so that's a feeling of the astronaut. But on the other hand, it shows that he feels very comfortable. You see that, uh, uh, as we have already discussed many times before, the China's first uh, Spacewalk performed in 2008 uh, in during the Shenzhou Seven mission by Mr. Zhai Zhigang, also by Mr. Liu Boming. But Liu Boming wears uh, uh, all land spacesuit made by Russia, and Mr. Zhai Zhigang uh, wears the China's Fatian spacesuit, but only uh, 20 minutes uh, spacewalk. Mm -hmm. So this time the spacewalk lasted for more than six hours, actually speaking, nearly seven hours. So you see, this shows that the China's portable life support system is already very practical. Right. The portable life support system is very important for the EVA or the actual vehicular activity. Dr. Gosh, you see the excitement of uh, Professor Yang, even the speed of his words are you know, already picking up. Uh, you could tell that Absolutely. many in China, especially in his trade, are extremely excited about that. But it's not just about testing the spacesuits, it's also about making sure there's installation of new equipment for the space station. And also, there's likely to be more welcoming of other astronauts uh, from other parts of the world onto China's uh, space station by the end of 2022. So Dr. Gosh, from your perspective, how do you see the latest development? Well, I think it's incredible, you know. I think as a space scientist, the more people, um, the more countries the more astronauts that come to the club and to uh, kind of further the cause of space exploration, the better it is. So it's right now amazing that we have two different space stations orbiting around around the Earth um, and um, two different countries. Um, actually, for, for the US, it is the International Space Station is much more than two countries. Uh, several countries uh, enjoying in this journey, the people enjoying in this journey um, I think it's an incredible feeling. Mm. Talking about incredible feeling for all of us, uh, we did notice uh, the manned space ship uh, uh, Shenzhou 12 actually have got a congratulation letter from the uh, NASA chief, uh, Mr. Nelson. That to many is quite a nice surprise. He sent it about a few weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Gosh, how do you see, even under the current uh, difficult and challenging geopolitical circumstances, the people really in the fields of space are looking at one another's achievements, Dr. Ghosh. I think there is a widespread appreciation from the technical community and the scientific community. Because remember, outside the arc lights and the uh, press briefings, this is something very difficult. And so people who have been involved in this, you know, all these missions is they are the result of five or ten years of very very hard work and um and there is a huge vision behind it mm. you know to explore space to take as elon musk says takes take mankind beyond earth and make them of extraplanetary species uh, when colleagues succeed i, th I think it's the, the there's there's a tremendous positive feeling here mm. and i think it would be reciprocated everywhere i think Mm. because ultimately it's the human journey. Actually, one party's success would also be circumstances in which other parties could enjoy more resources and attention as well, even under the current circumstances. Professor Yang, from your perspective, how do you see this uh, both cooperation to a certain extent, at least cooperative spirit among the scientific and technical communities between the two countries and also this competition to say the least? Well, you see, uh, to concerning about cooperation and competition, I don't think there are any com uh, competition, uh, at, at least for China. You see that China has expressed its uh, concept that we uh, uh, develop the space technology according to our own needs. We don't compete with other countries. Uh, so uh, I, uh, on, at least on the China side, they don't have any uh, uh, competition. 
uh, for, for the co cooperation, you may notice that the China Manned Space Agency has uh, raised uh, the proposals for joint experiments with, together with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, or WUNUSA. So uh, uh, from 17 countries, we get proposals, and uh, nine mm. uh, experiments have been chosen for the, uh, for the, uh, to, to, be, to be selected. And uh, uh, in the future, it will be shipped by the Tianzhou cargo ship to the station and, and be performed there. So right. uh, we can see that this kind of cooperation has already started. Mm. So Dr. Gosh, what Professor Yang is trying to say, we are international too. Right, absolutely. And I think you have to understand the magnitude of these missions, mm. the amount of effort involved. Not everyone can have every expertise. So NASA regularly signs on um, different countries, and NASA gets on missions with different countries um, to be, it be a Venus mission, be it be a Mars mission. Um, so this is just common practice. I think it helps both um, partners or how many ever partners there are. If they bring some unique skills to the table, right. then um, ultimately both parties win. This is just because the, there is such a different expertise involved in each of the missions, it enriches everybody if they collaborate. Mm. The world remembered when the first spacewalk took place on the moon, uh, and that becomes such a historic moment. Of course, that was taking place during the Cold War time, but even at that time, the world was appalled and also celebrating, no matter where they are. Now. China's space program is catching up, certainly, to that of the United States, even though there is still distance between the two. Obviously, this is extremely exciting for many Chinese as well. But also, there is the fact that others have done it before. So how do you see, on the one hand, the excitement, but on the other hand, also, the urgency of finding you know, the unique characteristics or not of the Chinese missions? For many fields, we are just uh, repeating others or behind others. For instance, the uh, space for uh, uh, the day before last. You see that uh, the U.S., as you have mentioned, the uh, U.S. and the former Soviet Union, uh, their first uh, space for happened in uh, 1965. Uh, so we are just uh, more than 40 years behind them uh, because this is uh, very necessary for uh, the construction and the future uh, research work and the maintenance of the station. So we have to do this uh, no, no matter who have already done this before. But but on the other hand, we also have many innovations uh, just uh, uh, leading uh, in the world. For instance, we are the first one to perform the manned automatic docking on the lunar orbit by the Chang'e 5 mission. We mm -hmm. are also the first one to have a soft landing on the far side of the moon. So these are the first in the world. So in China, you, you may notice that China is still a developed country, so we have only have limited budgets on space programs, but mm -hmm. we have uh, certain breakthroughs in uh, certain areas, in some small areas, uh, faster than other countries, but in other uh, areas, as I've mentioned, we de develop this kind of technology uh, according to our own needs, uh, no matter who have already done that before. Another point is about space power vis-a-vis -vis soft power, uh, or even hard power. As we know, during the Cold War time, there was a space uh, competition. Uh, I'm not exactly. sure whether we are already on the edge of a new Cold War because it's debatable and it's debated every day around the world. But Dr. Ghosh, uh, tell me more about how you see the issue of uh, um, space power vis-a-vis -vis soft power, hard power. See, I think the Cold War with the Russians in the 60s uh, was more a real space race or an arms race. Somehow, capability in space was taken as um, capability for military might, right? So I think in this age, say, if um, China and U.S. do different things on the moon, say, say uh, one has a rover here and the other has, is doing something different, um, there is no direct military, even from a perception point of view, say uh, the U.S. has is measuring uh, with a radar underground water mm -hmm. um, on, the, on Mars using, using, the, uh, using the U.S. rover and the Chinese rover is also doing exactly the same thing. But there is no military, I think, application of this, right? What would you know? I mean, 
you would know whether there's water below the Earth on b below Mars, below the surface of Mars. Professor Yang agree? Uh, I totally agree with Mr. Dr. Amit Tapagot. You see that, uh, for instance, uh, if we have a, a probe or have a manned spaceship on the moon, you see that for returning to the Earth, they need at least three days. So how can this be a military purpose? So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's nonsense to say that. Uh, th that's ridiculous to say that it has any uh, military usage. So I think this, uh, even if they have a race or competition, maybe that's only for, uh, for instance, during the uh, space race between US and the, the former Soviet Union, that's only for the reputation of both countries and not for any pur uh, military purposes on the moon. There are very interesting comments uh, coming from all over the world about China's space program. There have been talk about whether China's space power will be translated at least into soft power. However, others suggest that there are different reasons as to why it would be difficult. For example, they would say it's state-owned enterprises involving. The links between the space program and Chinese military is unclear. They could also say that some of the technologies China used today were already developed by the others in the earlier space explorations, as we mentioned earlier. So, Professor Yang, how do you see these kinds of uh, discussion? And to uh, a, a science person like you in the Chinese space science programs, how do you see the real purpose of this development? Uh, well, you see, uh, some of the comments from the public are correct. You see that the space program or the space technology, the space field is very important for a space capable nation, for a big country like China. So uh, there is link, they do have a link between the space technology and the, uh, what you mentioned, the uh, soft power of a country. So the uh, developing the space program is very uh, important and very helpful for a country to uh, develop its own uh, high technology field and also the whole uh, society and the economy. So this is correct. But on the other hand, you see, uh, although uh, from the history, from the view of history, the space technology come from the start from the World War II, from the V2 uh, missile or the rocket. But uh, also the space technology has a uh, few use. But today it has been proved that uh, at least for the manned space program and for the deep space exploration, they do not have any military purposes. And it has been proved that although the U.S. and the former Soviet Union have some military purpose, um, uh, human space flight in the maybe from the 1960s to 1990s, mm -hmm. but it has been proved that's uh, very have low, uh, very very low efficiency. So uh, today uh, it has been proved that uh, it's no need to uh, have some military purpose on uh, manned space flights. So you can see that you may uh, he, uh, you may also read from the internet there are some criticize uh, to uh, to the U.S. that they have some military purpose experiment on board the ISS. So uh, this is not correct. Mm. What do you mean by this is not correct? That the uh, fact that, that you know that the International Space Station is for the uh, peaceful usage of the outer space for all mankind, uh -huh. and it should not be concerned with any connected with any any military purpose. Dr. Gosh. So I think uh, I agree with everything that Dr. Yang said. Um, so there is um, everything here is of science value. You know, even the data that is collected by NASA by perseverance, a curiosity, they immediately released on websites, you know, mm -hmm. on, on the NASA website and other ways. So if it was military of military strategic data, it would never be, would have been put out there. Um, so the only thing which is indirectly associated in this picture with the military is, of course, the launch vehicle capability. Mm -hmm. And that has some dual use implications. But if you look at everything else, a cancer experiment, uh, experiment on calcium loss okay. um, on, this, on the space station, um, this is, I think, if the technology gets out there, it will benefit everybody. And I don't think any country will perhaps keep it to themselves. Talking about the space stations, now we have two already in the outer space. One is a Chinese one, but China believes it should be an international one. One is uh, initiated in the United States, but also the U.S. believe it is an international one. So, Professor Yang, let me ask you, it is very likely that it is developing countries and emerging economies that's going to take advantage of China's international space station now. Uh, how do you see the future trends of the work taking place on two different space stations? And how is it likely to categorize the future of research 
that International Space Station will be able to carry out. This, to me, is fascinating. Well, I can show you a very uh, interesting example. Uh, in 2014, uh, during a Congress of the Astronauts called the Congress of the uh, Association of Space Explorers, uh, so uh, more than uh, 200 astronauts from all over the world come into Beijing. And during this Congress, the other astronauts asked Mr. Yang Liwei, the first man of China in space, uh, a question. Will the China Space Station named ISS-2? And Mr. Yang Li <laughs> said that the name is not important. The important thing is to have the international cooperation. Uh. So on the China's on the release, formal release of the China's National Space Administration, that the China Space uh, Space Station is not only a, a national laboratory in space, but also a very very important platform for the international cooperation in space field. So you can see that, uh, as you have mentioned, this has been a very good chance for the uh, for the uh, for those countries, the, the developing countries, to perform their scientific research in space. So uh, uh, we can go back into history that China and Brazil have very close uh, uh, cooperations in Earth observation uh, satellites. And also, the Pakistan launched its first, uh, its first satellites uh, by China's uh, uh, carrier rocket in uh, 1990. So these are uh, very good in, uh, examples uh, of cooperations between the uh, countries from the, uh, the developing countries. And also, I believe that China will continue to do that. As, as we have previously discussed, China has a very close cooperation with UNUSA. So uh, with the help of the United Nations, I think all the uh, developing countries can benefit from mm. this uh, station. Dr. Gosh, how do you see these two international stations, stations are likely to be different from one another, particularly in the future? I think it will be the same. You know, it is hmm. scientists from, I don't know, from Pakistan, um, Dr. Young mentioned, or um, any other country will be just scientists. I mean, they will be doing scientific research. So it is the same standard of proof. It is the same standard of experiments. So there will be no difference. Um, but I want to interject one point, tiny point is we are talking about the space station today, that there are two space stations. What I found really interesting is um, China has also announced plans for a human mission to Mars in, I think, 2032. Yes. And that is the time frame also um, Elon Musk is planning to send humans to Mars. So the next decade will be tremendously interesting for all purposes you know since the apollo program mm -hmm. since man landed on uh, on the moon uh, 50 years back we have been stuck on the moon mm -hmm. so you know if you ask somebody in the 1970s they would they would have said that in by 1980 we would be on mars and we were never never on mars so there is a joke that you know there was all this hoopla about getting to Mars and all we got is Twitter, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but here there are in 10 years, two major countries uh -huh. have uh, actually unveiled very serious plans for a human landing to Mars, uh -huh. which for the first time will take humans from the surface of the moon to the surface of Mars, which is going to be incredible. Well, I guess, I guess we're going to get more than just Twitter, right? Professor Young? Yes, 2032. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know that, uh, Miss Kenway, uh, what Dr. Gosh has mentioned is, uh, uh, is a report by Mr. Wang Xiaojun, who is the uh, chief of the uh, China's Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology. But uh, what uh, Dr. Gosh has mentioned is only a proposal, not the uh, not a plan approved by the central government. Uh, for now, even the human mission to the moon has not approved by the central government of China. Mm -hmm. So you see, we only have proposals. But in recent days, the difference from the Mars mission and the human moon mission is that China has made many uh, concrete preparations for the moon mission. And I believe that sooner or later, China's astronauts can walk on the moon. But on the other hand, concerning the uh, Mars missions, you see that, as I've already mentioned, uh, mentioned many times, China is still a developing country. China ha only has two uh, mass, uh, robotic mass missions, uh, including the Tiananmen mission and the future sample mission, mission, only two. But as we have discussed before, the U.S. have almost uh, one, uh, one mission for every two years. Mm. Uh, so you see, uh, they do not have any uh, uh, competition in the mass exploration mm. area. And for the, um, for the human mission to the mass, it's far, uh, it, it, I believe it's still, uh, we need to wait a long, long time. Thank you so much for the both of you, Yang Yuguang and Ami Tabagosh. Really appreciate it. 
You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Coming up, South Korea is one of the closest countries to China culturally and geographically, many say. I speak to former South Korean Prime Minister Han Su Su to see how both can cooperate on climate change, the pandemic control and prevention, and multilateral organization. Welcome back. This is World Insight, and I'm Tian Wei. As the world seems to be facing an increasingly bumpy recovery amid the new geopolitical uncertainties, China and South Korea have been respectively working hard on the issue of climate change. Both countries have ambitious carbon emission goals in the near future, accelerating the shift away from their previously coal-reliant economies. Earlier, I sat down with former South Korean Prime Minister Han Jun Su to see how the two countries expand cooperation on climate change, pandemic control and prevention, and multilateralism. In addition to serving as South Korean Prime Minister from 2008 to 2009, he was also the President of UN General Assembly from 2001 to 2002. Meanwhile, he served as the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. Let's listen in. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure to see you on CGTN. Well, I'm also pleased to be invited for the interview. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Let me start by asking about the carbon issue. China has pledged a 2030-2060 carbon peak, carbon neutrality. I understand where you are. South Korea has also been making commitment in that regard. Tell me how the two countries are likely to be encouraging for one another in that area. Well, um, President Xi Jinping announced last September that China will aim to peak emission before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. This is a very bold and ambitious target for China. Uh, everybody in the world is affected, will be affected by it. In order to achieve 1.5 Celsius, degree Celsius of the Paris Climate Agreement, we need the world needs China's close cooperation. As you may know, as of 2018, China accounted for 27.3% of the global carbon emission, while US for 14.9%. Together, United States and China together accounted for about 41% of the global carbon emission. Therefore, China's role in uh, the uh, achievement of the Paris uh, climate agreement is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now, I hear that China is going to introduce carbon market. Yes. And I'm sure that carbon market will expand the role of supply and demand for carbon in the market and will play a very important role in reducing carbon emissions. Korea, of course, has been going through this process and we have also announced um, carbon neutrality by 2050. And we are very happy that uh, my government is supporting uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Mm. Mr. Prime Minister, you are, you have been with tremendous efforts working on the climate change issue, starting from earlier in the, with the United Nations. Now tell me, how do you, as a veteran of the issue, see the ups and downs of the issue over the years due to geopolitics and politics? Well, as you may know, I also appointed the Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for yes. Climate Change in 2007 before I entered re rejoined the government as a Prime Minister. At the time, I was appointed together with Gro Harlem Brundtland, former Prime Minister of Norway, and also Ricardo Lagos, uh, former President of Chile. And three of us worked together. And uh, that was the year, 2007, was a very important year in the history of climate change because we had the COP13, Conference of Party 13 in Bali, Indonesia. Mm. And um, we had to encourage the global leaders to uh, attend the uh, COP13. Therefore, Guru Harlem, uh, Brundtland was allocated to Europe and Africa and Lagos to Americas. And I was allocated to Asia and the Pacific to go around to meet the leaders, to invite them to attend the COP13. Uh, and as you may know, COP13 was a great success because um, at the time, Kevin Rudd, then uh, Australian Prime Minister, just elected, right. came to attend the meeting 
said that uh, he, Australia, will uh, um, uh, agree to join the um, Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. which was a uh, fantastic news at the time. But at the same time, we also invited by the U.S. Uh, Congress to testify in front of them. So three of us went to the U.S. Congress and uh, testified before the members of the House of Representatives. What, I, what we found was that there was a clear divide between the party lines, Republicans against and Democrats for the climate change. So um, it was a very interesting experience. Now, Mr. Prime Minister, we could say we are at a better time right now, but the national politics and election cycle is never far away from us. So as a veteran, once again, how do you see the realities today? How do we make sure this momentum will continue and will not be disrupted as we have witnessed over the past 10 years or so and beyond? Well, you know, climate change is um, um, external economy of uh, global scale. Everybody has to be there unless uh, then it cannot be, uh, it cannot be solved. So whether it's a big country or small country, everybody has to be. Fortunately, as of today, I think there's no one country in the world which is against the achievement of the Paris Climate Agreement. But the implementing this, um, uh, this uh, agreement in yeah. the next 30 years is another question because we have never done it before and we have to do it learning by doing. Yes. And, um, and also we have broken so many promises in the past, for example, uh, UNFCC 1992 and um, Kyoto Protocol 1997 and also uh, the Durban Agreement. There were major agreements at the time, but no country have uh, really achieved uh, carried out that agreement to the to the to the end and so we are now here although uh, everybody is agreed to have uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 we have to wait and see what will happen mr. prime minister I understand you are working on the issue of water a lot these days as we know <clears throat> The overall environmental issue is a huge topic and in which there are various categories of issues and water certainly is one of those most crucial uh, because it means geopolitics, it means peace and war, it means access to real uh, basic human rights in a way. Uh, so how do you see, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, countries and governments are facing up to the issue of water. What are the complexities you would uh, illustrate for us now? As you may know, the climate change is um, exposed to the humanity through water. Yes. When temperature goes up, sea level water gets warmer and you create more uh, steams that creates um, uh, typhoons or hurricanes or cyclones or whatnot. And also when it's too hot, then you have a lot of um, uh, area where it is arid. So water is a very essential uh, sort of in dealing with the climate change issues. But apart from that, water disaster itself is also very important. Every year, billions of people are affected by the water disasters. And with the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic now, we are having two difficult problems altogether. That is that when you have a water disasters, typhoons, people tend to cluster in the school or in public area to uh, shelter from the water and flood. But in the case of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, people should not cluster. So people mm -hmm. has to not get together. So when you have a water disaster during the COVID-19 pandemic, you have this problem, paradoxical problem of trying to deal with this problem. Co-occurrence of disasters are very, very difficult. So uh, we in the water community is very much worried about this situation. Mr. Prime Minister, people are talking about the issue of a pandemic. 
And we all know that's the priority we really need to deal with together with other global issues. But there is a lack of cooperative spirit in terms of uh, uh, how we can cooperate right now. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you are a seasoned politician. You are also a veteran of globalization. How do you see the current situation? Do we need statesmen, stateswomen? Do we need leadership? Do we need the grassroots up efforts? What do we need now so that we can come out of this deadlock, as we all know? Uh, having served my government at time of very close global cooperation, I am a little bit dismayed to see the current state of affairs. Uh, but we have to come back to the basics, ideals of the United Nations. There are a lot of uh, areas where all the nations of the world can work together, like climate change, for example, water disaster. These are the issue, not uh, uh, affecting just one country, but we are all affected by it. So we have to choose the area of mutual concern and mutual uh, commonality, and then try work to work, work together. So mm -hmm. in that respect, I think the role of climate change is really very important. Also, water and disaster is also very important. Right. But Mr. Prime Minister, you know everything could be politicized or geopoliticized. We see that with the pandemic about the virus origin, about the vaccines, about the distribution, about who uses what. Uh, all of these are politicized. But in fact, it is a pandemic issue. It's a global health issue. So how much confidence do we have, Mr. Prime Minister? I have to invite for your intelligence here, you know, about that we are not going to politicize or further politicize the, the climate change issue, the water issue, the carbon issue, Mr. Prime Minister? Well, I think uh, it's unfortunate that uh, COVID-19 pandemic is becoming a political issue. But in actual fact, uh, in order to, to deal with the COVID-19, we are happy to see that the vaccines are now uh, invented and many people are now being subject to vaccination. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that many countries are now giving vaccine doses to their people. But unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, country, developed, developing countries where they, are not, uh, they do not have uh, vaccine doses as much as they wanted. In a sense, we have, just as 20 years ago, we had a digital divide. We are now having COVID-19 divide, mm -hmm. divide between developed and developing countries. Therefore, I think uh, rich countries should not hold their vaccine doses, but try to uh, give uh, to the developing countries so that uh, all the nations of the world, people of the world, nations of the world can benefit from it. If we don't do that, if we have uh, one area, poor area of the world, not, con not uh, vaccinated, then that will be a center of the future pandemic. So we are all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. I hope many would understand that, that very basic fact, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. But on the other hand, I also want to ask you, because uh, there is the issue of leadership. We have been hearing from many others about, you know, when are we going to see the real statesman? At a time of global crisis, at a time of uh, uh, global issues, that is urgently needed. Mr. Prime Minister, you served in various uh, administrations, you also served in the United Nations. You see the ups and downs of politics, national and international. How do you see that? Well, I think um, in some area, leadership is there. In some area, leadership is not there. Fortunately, in the area of uh, mutual concern, like water and um, COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, I think global leadership is there. Only problem is how to coordinate their leadership on mm. these particular issues. So um, we really have to choose the area where leaders can cooperate together intensively. And then uh, from there, we can expand the area of leadership to other more contentious area, eventually mm -hmm. trying to solve the problems more sort of amicably and peacefully. This is the time when the international mechanism have been weakened. But at the same time, one could also argue the system needs to be upgraded and updated. That includes the United Nations, that includes WHO, that includes WTO, and the name goes on. Uh, but you know, to what extent it's about reform? To what extent it's about uh, 
that all needs to understand the importance and significance of these global platforms that are existing today. Mr. Prime Minister. Well, there are many international non-governmental organizations like, for example, Club de Madrid, which is the uh, meeting of the former head of state and government, yes. has a very interesting sort of a forum to encourage global leaders to get together to deal with the problems of the present uh, concern. Mm. So um, I am actually a little bit optimistic about this. People, government leaders in some countries are not, may not be, but I think on the whole, there is a genuine need of the leaders and as well as former leaders to work together to create a better future for our gener next generation. Mr. Prime Minister, you belong to the generation that experienced the very climax of the Cold War. How do you see the qualities of leadership at a time of such dramatic change as we are witnessing today? As I said, we have to go back to the basics. And at the time of, for example, international global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, right. all the world leaders gathered together to create G20. And that has worked very well. Now, uh, in time of a crisis like this, I think the global leaders has to meet together to discuss the issue of uh, glo global concern. Fortunately, um, a few weeks ago, we had G7 meeting in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. And at the time, it was uh, not online, but offline meeting. I think even G20, for example, should get together uh, face, -face, face to face and try to deal with the problems. When you meet the people, the situation becomes a little bit easier mm -hmm. and uh, you can really talk to each other more frankly than by giving or sending um, uh, messages so on papers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate that we are going through a very difficult time of COVID-19, but as soon as this situation eases, I hope that global leaders will get together. At the United Nations headquarters, for example, it will be a good place uh, in September. Usually the General Assembly has a meeting then. Mm. So all the leaders should get together and try to talk to each other and um, face to face and try to discuss the problem, their concern, as well as global concern, so that they can leave some legacy, good mm. legacy to the future generation. Mr. Prime Minister, what a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. All the best wishes. Thank you very much for...